So welcome to the panel on building founder communities and startup ecosystems. And I would love to, first of all, appreciate you. Uh, we really are here because of all of you. Founders, startups, build, builders, ecosystem shapers, investors. Um, so we really, really are very grateful for you to be here. And I'll start by, well, I am Virginia, Director of Programs and Community at Latitude. And I'll start by introducing my three incredible guests over here. We have Ian Hathaway. Ian Hathaway has just founded a new VC called Fardo Ventures. Before this, he was in Techstars, a senior VP at Techstars. And he also is co-author of Startup Communities Way with Brett Felt. Then we have Camila Junqueira, uh, who is the managing director at Endeavor. And um, Endeavor, I found out recently, is actually the biggest office for Endeavor globally. Um, so it's pretty amazing. And I also just found out that the scale-up program was created here in Brazil. And Andre Barrense, and I'm going to say it with a Spanish accent, <laughs> heads of Google startup for LATAM, and I know Andre has been an incredible pioneer, not only on building startup communities, but also on diversity and inclusion. So thank you everybody for being here. Very grateful that you are. And uh, let's get started. So I had a lot of notes. Community, pretty buzzy word. We hear it all the time now. Everybody's like, build a community first. Don't build an app. Don't build a product. So let's start by addressing kind of like, what is a community? So what is a community for each of you? And how do you know when you actually have built a community? We can start in order. So Ian, go ahead. Uh, well, first of all, thanks for having me. It's an honor to be here. Um, I guess, in short, this is a community. Uh, uh, very simply, um, I think about you know communities in the obvious way. You know, people that are coming together to solve common challenges. Um, more than a network, it's a deeper connection. You know, a collective sense of purpose. For me, a very simple definition for a sort of community is a group of people who are helping entrepreneurs succeed. Now we all have different roles that we play. We work for organizations, we're investing capital, we're providing mentorship, maybe we work for a company. But I, I think the startup community overall, rather than you know, an ecosystem, which I think is a larger construct, is, is all about the individual one-to-one -one connection, just looking for ways, big and small, to help entrepreneurs succeed. Yeah, I, I was thinking about that. Hi, guys. Hi. <laughs> Boa tarde para os brasileiros que estão aqui. Um, so I was thinking about that, about uh, community building. And there is a quote from David Spinks. I think it's his name. Yeah. And uh, he wrote a book about that, actually. And we were studying that. We are always studying about community in, in, at Endeavor. And uh, he wrote that to build communities, you have, you have to help people help each other. So you build relationships. So I think that's a good definition uh, about communities. It's about relationships and it's about relationships between uh, individuals and they are so strong that when you, when you look at the group, the group is strong. So that's what we try to do at Endeavor. And when we talk about founders community, and uh, there's a big difference because, because founders have little time for bullshit. They, they need to be in their business. So every interaction needs to be really relevant and they need to take something out of this relationship. And what we do at Endeavor is to think about, um, so what we do to create a strong co community and we can talk about that later is cu curatorship. So to have a really curated group of people that are there uh, because of something, they have a shared vision. 
but also matchmaking. So being able to really connect the right person with the right person. And when we look about that, we look not only in the entrepreneur's side, but also in the mentor's side. They all need to uh, add some value, take some value out of this interaction. And most of our mentors nowadays are entrepreneurs, so they all have just little time to, to spare, so the community needs to be relevant. Hi, everyone. Oops. <laughs> Wake up. I'm kidding. Uh, so good to be here. It's a pleasure to be with Camila. We haven't seen each other for some time. Ian, I just met him, and Vichy, thank you for the invitation. I will just add a few more thoughts to what has been said because I think they hit, hit the nail in the head. Um, to me, a community, it's first and foremost built by and for entrepreneurs. So it's, there can be facilitators, but first and foremost, it's driven and created and ran by entrepreneurs. Second, there must be something that goes beyond just the interest it has to be something deeper, something that is a value, a shared purpose, a shared vision for something that is being built together. So the sum of the parts becomes larger than them disconnected. And then the third one is, I really like this idea that was brought by Adam Brandt a few years ago in a book. It's called um, Give or Take. And he tells something about the types of personality. So he says that some people, some people are givers, some people are matchers, some people are takers. Uh, but a thriving community, in my opinion, you need, a greater ba you need a balance, but you need a greater number of givers. So you need people who are willing to give more than take so that the community can thrive so that the value taken is not as big as the value created. So that, that's what creates a lasting, a sustainable community and something that can share a lot of value through time. Hello. Okay, go ahead, Camille. I was going to say today uh, someone asked me about the mentorship. So why are these people like all donating their time like why are they doing that someone asked me and it's been a long time since I didn't I did not had to think about that and uh, what Andre said about givers it's just that when you understand uh, you 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 are receiving so much when you give like it's what we hear from all the mentors like I honestly believe it, this is the mentor speaking okay I, I, I honestly believe that every mentorship I give, I come out much better than I went and I, I believe that I received much more than I gave. Like every time, because they're, they're learning some other business model or some other way to think a business or the structure of this company or this other company or some uh, more details about, about a specific sector that they're interested in. So it's so much learning involved in, in uh, receiving that uh, it becomes interest, interesting. It's uh, easy to give. It's easy to give. That's, that's exactly that. Yeah. And um, uh, Techstars has this hashtag called give first. It's oh. a really effective way of building relationships, which we just talked about is sort of the center of communities. And it's not pure altruism, right? You're expecting to get something. You're just looking for ways to help people. And you know that by giving to the community, it will reward you, right? We're all building companies. We're all helping entrepreneurs. When more of us succeed, we all succeed as well. And so and rather than, you know, keeping having a transactional mindset, Right, uh, thinking in a positive sum game, thinking of, from a position of abundance, knowing that when other people do well, I'm going to do well, and that's that's essentially what Give First is, and it's very easy and, and a great motto for for relationships outside of business building as well. I'm adding one more thing, Virginia. Go for it, go for it. I'm just like loving this because for those that are part of the Latitude community, I feel like every single thing you've said 
is something that we implement and I'm like, yes, we're doing it right, you guys. <laughs> yeah, and of course here we are talking about entrepreneurs community, both uh, three of us, but you can just think of that for other communities, right? So right. when you think about a community, you need a network of really true peers. It's what we say at Endeavor. So we say at Endeavor that we are off by and for entrepreneurs. Of course, if we want to create a community of entrepreneurs, we need to be off by and for entrepreneurs. And then you can think of your community in the same way for other publics. Love it. And I'm going to actually go a little bit more into, you, you mentioned, all of you mentioned, well, the give first mentality, right? That is actually that we also practice a latitude in our community, but also the power of connection and engagement. So I actually think that there's nothing worse than being ghosted after a date. Yep, actually there is. A ghost community that doesn't engage, that doesn't talk, that doesn't react, that doesn't do anything. So how do we avoid this? Like, how do we maintain our communities engaged? How do we fuel them? How do we continue to connect them? Sh should I go? Okay, I I'm happy to go. <laughs> go ahead. Um, well, I think what you're talking about is that uh, when communities lack relevance, right? When it's not actually adding value to the people it's supposed to be about, um, Right, which is the entrepreneurs, and something we were talking about backstage or wherever we were um, is about listening, right? And I think that's a much more effective way of building relationships. I think building communities is a lot like building products, actually. Trick question for later. Um, but it's okay, who's the customer, right? The customer is the entrepreneur, right? The founders are who all of us who are not actively building high growth companies, we're here to serve them. It's listening to what they need, not what we think, and you know, iterating, right? It's experimentation, trying to figure out uh, what's working and what's not, it's learning and adaptation. And so how do you avoid an empty community? Well, you have to have entrepreneurs at the heart of it. If entrepreneurs are not participating, it's not a community, right? And in order uh, for the community to be relevant, we've, we've gotta be listening and engaging um, on a frequent basis. Yeah, I was gonna say that one very important way to keep a community from becoming a ghosting community is to avoid at all costs that the community becomes simply transactional. Um, because when you establish a transactional relationship with the community, once that transaction is over, you're gone. Yep. And then whenever you need something else, you go there and you transact again, right? Um, when we think about the brands, the companies we love, there's much more to it than just going and buying something or accessing a product or a service. There is something that is emotional about that. There's something that is, it's not even rational, right? So how do you create that idea of bringing beyond transactional experiences to a community that will touch people's hearts, of course, we'll feed their minds, but that will also create this idea that that's a place where I nurture myself and I have access to, you know, like amazing people that are there for the same reason. When you do that, I think you get to something that is, in my opinion, it's the, it's kind of the oil of that engine for a, a thriving community, which is confidence. You know, you start trusting each other. You know, you start trusting each other, and then. It's amazing when you're in a place where you can trust people, right? Yep. So you want to go back to that environment. You want to go back to that feeling. So in my opinion, a ghost community is a transactional community. Um, so avoid at all costs keeping it transactional. Uh, feed confidence and feed this trusting and emotional experience to the community. I think uh, also depends on which community we are talking about. But now I'm going to talk about entrepreneurs community. So yes. that's what uh, binds us here. So what I, what I feel is that, uh, again, entrepreneurs have little time. So there's a balance between how much hours they can give to the community and, um, and, and the others 
all need to go to their businesses or their family or their health. <laughs> so many, so many other things we need to divide our time. So time is what we have that's most precious. And uh, you need to feel that you're using your time wisely. So one of the biggest differentiate differentiators of Endeavor, I, I think, and one of the things that made us stay strong with this high, um, high, high impact entrepreneurs is the, uh, the, curator, the curatorship capacity. So we say, okay, you have one hour per month to give. I'll use this hour in the best way to add value to you and to an entrepreneur that really needs your skills so this capacity of this community this cheerleading uh, role or this role of a connector between two parts of a community i i think they are really important for the community to stay living uh, of course you want if you have a big community with hundreds thousands of people you want them to just interact with each other with no um, uh, with, uh, with without this third party intervening but at Endeavor we have the central part because we are a community that's that are small and we need to keep them like that so we need this we need to be this uh, connector between entrepreneurs and I believe this is a good way not to have a ghost community for example can I add something that I think it's also part of this discussion? Uh, and, and I think it's really important and a, a, very, a very strong advice for avoiding a ghost community. I think the best communities, at least that I'm part of, uh, they also build some sense of identity. Yes. Um, so you become identified somehow with the peers that are in that community with you. Um, I think Endeavor is a great example. You know, like uh, Endeavor entrepreneurs, they, they identify each other and they feel part of that I identity. Uh, but many of us can think of different communities that we're part of, you know, like a sports community or something. Any business is a small community or a large community so, if you think about it, so right? Th that helps or that's very important to avoid the transactional trap because you go back there because you feel part of something that that's part of your identity as well. And I can tell that we definitely don't have a ghost community because everybody's so busy engaging, right? That's why we're not even mad that you guys are talking. We're not mad. We're like, yes, they're engaging. They're Get building connections. Phone. But it would be kind of nice if you listen. And that's what we're going to practice right now. So we always talk about like, listen to your community. They know what they, they'll tell you what they need. They'll tell you what they want. So before we practice community listening live, I would like to know how do you listen to your communities? Different tools, metrics, anything that you're using to listen to your communities. Do you want to take a chance? Ah, I, I can start. Just yep. being with them, it's a good way. Uh, in presence, okay, guys, not, not on Zoom or Google Meets, okay, I'm gonna mention. Uh, so being in presence, like, like we're doing here, and just uh, listen to your customer, your client, in, in our case, to be with entrepreneurs, it's a good way. Um, of course, there aren't this, you know, all the metrics we already know about, but we, we do lots of um, research, small checkpoints, uh, small pulse checks with the community. Every interaction we ask, how, how was it? Uh, we measure with NPS, with like the basic metrics to measure engagement, to measure, uh, and also, uh, but I, I still think to be with them and listen to what they have to say is the best way. I think, I think quality and frequency are very important variables to think of, you know, like, so what's the frequency that you are interacting with your community? Uh, 
Is it live, in real life? Is it virtually? How do you combine both? What's the right balance between those? So frequency of interaction is one that I think, I think it's very interesting to, it's not an ideal metric, but it's a proxy to measure, okay, so how active that community is. But then you can have a community that meets every week, but the quality of interaction is very low, right? So how do you measure the quality of that interaction? So was that valuable to you? Um, how many, you know, like good leads or interesting ideas, insights did you get? What was the outcome of a certain interaction you had? So I think the combination of both is, is really cool. But then there's a third one that connects to what I mentioned about identity, about being proud of being part of that. And there's a lot of amazing brands that measure how much pride there is in a certain association to that brand. So how, how proud do you feel of being part of Latitude? How proud do you feel of being part of Endeavor? How proud do you feel of being part of Google for Startups? So to me, those three metrics, um, they're not perfect because there's a lot of things that are, you know, like subjective. There's a lot of things that are not hard metrics, but they, they can give you a, somehow, you know, like a direction of where you are at and where you can go. Um, yeah, so I, I think it's really simple. It's about engagement, right? Consistent engagement in a deep one-to-one -one basis. That's how relationships are built and maintained and accelerated. One of the best practical ways of engaging with entrepreneurs is mentoring. So whether you've been a founder before um, and you want to help the next generation of entrepreneurs, like mentoring is amazing. And you don't have to be a former founder to mentor entrepreneurs. In fact, so many first time founders, the questions are very basic. If you have, you know, some business experience and some kind of a network, maybe, you know, you have industry expertise or domain expertise, whatever it is, a lot of the questions are very general. You know, how do I put together a slide deck? Like, how do I talk about what I'm trying to do here? And it's, it can be very basic, it can be very advanced, but it's a very practical way to help entrepreneurs. Um, I have been mentoring, I don't know, hundreds, hundreds of companies for the last decade, and I definitely get more out of it than they do. That's how I feel at the end. And, and they feel the same way, and that's a, that's a great exchange. Um, if we wanna talk about um, metrics, uh, you know, the, you know the, there's the quick flyby, which is how you measure lots of communities like, you know, can the members identify with the values? What's the retention? What's the level of engagement? I think for a startup community, um, you know, uh, maybe a useful framework is to think about outcomes rather than outputs. So like counting the number of attendees here is what I would call an output metric. That's 1,250. 1,250. Okay, so what? <laughs> what I want to know is how many new relationships were sparked here Right? How many you know, future co-founders met here? How many people connected someone else to their next angel investor or their new CTO? That shit is really hard to measure, right? Yep. But that's ultimately what we want to know. Why, what is the impact that we're having, the coming together? The last thing I'll say, a bigger sidebar, and uh, we won't go deep on this, but at a systems level, what I want to know is who's influential in the startup community? Is it organizations that are led by people who haven't scaled businesses, or is it founders, right? One of the things that I've been so impressed with my time here in Sao Paulo is that the founders who have built and are continuing to build companies are helping the next group of founders, I don't even wanna say generation, I'm talking like a few years behind them with their knowledge, with their networks, and their wealth, and that to me is the quintessential signal that a startup community is strong. We see that. Yeah. No, I was gonna. I was gonna say something that while I was, uh, Ian was uh, saying, it, it really hit me, um, which is, we can we can track, you know, like okay, so how many connections were generated in this event, and which is great, you know, like we we all love numbers. We're you know like we're all. I was actually going to say that we're about to write everything Ian said and send it on a survey after this event. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But there, but there are cer certain things, and I think probably the most important ones. Uh, 
what are the stories that come out of this? You know, uh, we are in an, I mean, we're all in tech, right? Um, so, so tech is an industry that is made of stories. Oh, it's the founder who met the co-founder in an event in the, at the university and they started a company. We can question if that's the, you know, like the true stories or not. But those are the stories that nurture the industry. And what are the stories that we want to nurture the communities? Um, so that's probably not measurable by hard numbers, but it's very impactful to show. It's, it's very important to show the impact of the community as well. And it takes a while. So a one while. thing, like we just did a uh, big community event for the Scaler program. And uh, woohoo, Scaler! We got some scale up we have some. We have some scale-ups here and the, the team from Endeavor Brazil. We have uh, spots open for the next batch, so hopefully we'll discuss with all, all the founders here. But what I, what I was going to say is that, uh, of course, we measure NPS and a bunch of metrics, but we, we are sure after six months, a year, we'll have the best stories. So I'll give you an example. Uh, 99, the first unicorn in Brazil, Paulo Veras uh, used to, is, is a, a mentor for Endeavor Brazil. And he actually met Ariel and Renato, his co-founders, in an Endeavor event. They, they were pitching him with another business. He didn't like the business, but he liked the founders. And then they started speaking and they started 99. We only knew about that like many years later. But it's amazing that this happened. But a happened. good story takes time, huh? Exactly. Yeah. I, I want to jump on that because I think that's one of the most important things, the arc of time, right? And how long it takes a startup community to develop. Uh, my my co-author, um, Brad, talks a lot about a 10-year view. And we kind of really talk about it as a generational view. I mean, think about some, I mean, companies are growing a lot faster these days. But in general, from found from founding to exit to the time that you know wealth has been created from those exits, which then gets recycled back into the next generation of entrepreneurs, that's 10, 15, 20 years, right? That's, that's half a lifetime. And our human minds really struggle with how long it takes, right? The other, so that's mistake number one that we make. You know, we've gotta be thinking, well, the way I think about it is I'm spending the rest of my working life helping entrepreneurs and that's it. I'm taking that view. Um, the second thing is the how important low frequency but high impact events are. And that's one of the shittiest things about this work is that we do so many things and then nothing comes from it or we don't know. Or there's this one connection, right? These two founders, how do you engineer that? And how many other connections were made that went nowhere? Hundreds, thousands before that. Uh, and that's a frustrating, uh, reality of all this, um, but but it's what we must do. I'll I'll finish on a quote that um, a VC. Uh, he's an economist turned VC, which I can relate to that. Um, but his name is Bill Janeway. He has this great quote. He said, uh, "Efficiency is the enemy of innovation." Right? We must be willing to tolerate a lot of waste in order to produce the high impact outcomes that we're looking for. Thank you for sharing that. And actually. You know, as I heard, uh, because Latitude has only been around for a year and a half. Uh, so we are just starting to, you know, see the progress and hear the stories. But I do have to say that I was like, how are we listening and how do we find out about the stories? And a great way has been Slack, right? Because in Slack, people are like writing. Gratitude, I found my co-founder in Latitude, LF, blah, blah, blah. And we're like, awesome. I feel like sometimes when we are not running online programs, it would be a lot harder to capture this. So it got me thinking, but really, really interesting. And um, with that, let's listen to our community. So a lot of you have been engaging on the app. Uh, we are going to read one or two, I think one question uh, and I'm gonna go for this one <clears throat> a community is very dependent on the members how do you ensure the community keeps its essence and its values when it grows at 
grows fast. Oh. Yeah, I think it depends. So I think the effort is pretty basic because we curate who enters in the community. So uh, what Andrea was talking about, shared values, um, like the, the sense of purpose, shared sense of purpose. Uh, we have one of the, the best things Endeavor does is the selection process. It's pretty rigid. It's lots of mentors involved in bringing one entrepreneur to the network. So we make sure that this entrepreneur is, is really a peer to the others and then the community stays with the same values, but it depends on the community. So I'm talking specifically about a community that's curated and there, there is a selection process. I don't know if you can share other communities that are more open. Uh, well, I mean, <clears throat> I think communities must be open, right? Anyone, and, and my, the way I think about it is anyone who says they're a part of the startup community is a part of the startup community unless they're harmful or toxic or whatever, uh, we have to have that radical embrace of inclusivity. Um, that being said, uh, I think the leaders really matter, right? And, 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 you know, this is not just in startup communities, it's for societies, politics. People behave like the leaders. The leaders demonstrate how to behave and people follow that. So the hope is that strong leaders will emerge and by the way, that doesn't have to be the old guy who built his company 20 years ago, right? It can be the young people on the periphery who see a new way, creating a new center of gravity in the community. So if, if the existing power structures or center of gravity in a startup community is tired or toxic or unhealthy or whatever, new, new centers of gravity can emerge. And it's really the people who are building companies at that time who are able to do that in the most relevant way. But like startup community is a big community then you have smaller communities inside that right and it's easier to have like shared values shared values and shared like interested interests in smaller communities isn't it i don't know i'm just yes and it's all the yeah it's yeah. not the startup community is not just one like this is it here we are this is the start this is the whole startup community but yeah, there are lots of, you know, centers of gravity and, you know, different, you know, people who are into certain types of companies or even within a city of this size, like they're built by neighborhoods, right? They're built um, oftentimes by networks that, you know, pre-existing networks such as universities or, you know, high schools you went to, right? Um, places you used to work. But so, yeah, of course. But um, I, I was thinking because in our case, you know, like we always say when we think about the community of startups in our alumni network, <clears throat> they've all been selected. You know, they, they went through a process and we often say that selecting startups for any program, for any initiative is the single most important thing we do. Um, of course, there, we made some mistakes, we made some right decisions and it's okay. So when you can have that selection and have very clear criteria, processes, values, and transparency on that, I think that's super important. And that, that helps a lot in sustaining the quality of that community. I was also thinking that I, I've been part of a community that uh, it was an open community, entrepreneur community, which is the San Pedro Valley community in BH, in Belo Horizonte. Uh, and when we, we kind of started the community, it was, you know, like a group of folks. Um, they were all donating time, energy, and of course, a lot of intention there. But basically, anyone could get to the website and say, okay, my company's here, I'm part of San Pedro Valley. And of course, it, it grew or it outgrown a lot what it had started initially. And with that comes a lot of challenges, right? Um, there's the quality challenge, the frequency challenge, the value creation challenge, the leadership challenge. So it's not always easy, but I, I think that there, there has to be some very careful listening, very careful leadership to make sure you're understanding these movements within a community. So that it, I don't know if it's a proper moderation, but it's a very careful listening, a very careful leadership to make sure you understand 
at which stage or which part of a community cycle you're in. Uh, because it will change. Uh, the community will always be changing. It's a living organism. So especially the, the, the open, the larger ones. So how do you make sure that what's important remains? Uh, for that, you need to make more questions and have conclusions. And you need people who are donating more time than others to make that sustainable. So that's, that, that's how I see you know, like sustainability and quality in growing communities. Great, and I, I actually, we do have time for another question. And because we're here in real life, I really wanted to ask this. It says, what is the role of in real life events to develop founder communities? How do you see events evolving in a post-pandemic startup ecosystem? I don't know if we can call ourselves post-pandemic. Are we there? I mean, we're here, so yes, we are. <laughs> well, this week, according Joe to the World Health Organization, not yet, but. <laughs> well, this week, Joe Biden said it's over, so I guess oh. that means it's over. No, I think that was an accident. It's over, people. <laughs> uh, well, I'll just, I'll just have a quick answer. Um, they're essential. I mean. This is amazing to be here. It's not the same as having the little white box with your name next to it. I think the thing that's different moving forward, or I hope is different, is that we're more intentional about the time we do spend together. Before the pandemic, I felt like there was, I had event fatigue, even within, I was living in London, England at the time, and it was just too much. There was always something. So I think as long as we're more intentional, right? Higher quality, maybe lower frequency, there is absolutely no substitute. And this event has been a great reminder of that for me. Totally agree. Just adding to that, I believe that um, a high quality event that's made for you, because that you have a bunch of events, but what event will be beneficial for you and your sense of belonging and community and what you want to build. It's not all of them, so you need to choose. But when you choose wisely and you are in the, in the right event, right time, right moments, right location, then you have this, um, your energy bar just goes up and you can spend a few more months um, in the virtual world before having a big event again. So it's how we do that. It's how we do it in, uh, at Endeavor with our events. It's just, um, and you can also um, do, uh, uh, and, uh, try to do big events and then smaller segmented community events, uh, maybe lunches, happy hours with smaller groups. And then, but the energy bar, it's just th doesn't go that, that high. And then you do a big event again and you start all over. But I think they're essential. Like for us, after we, do, we did the Scale Up uh, event, some, some people from our team were working at Endeavor for three years without being in at an Endeavor event. It seemed like crazy. And after they, uh, the, the event w finished, they were like, now I understand Endeavor. I'm like, oh my God, three years later, they understand what Endeavor is all about. But that's, like, that's how strong is an in-person event. We can run a quick test here. So we are prob probably at you know, like one of the last um, things at the event, right? So you've all been here the entire day. You're probably physically exhausted. You're tired. But how many of you here are leaving this event with more energy to go back and work and, you know, like accomplish things than when you got to the event? Please raise your hands. The other ones weren't listening. So, yes. 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 100%. Okay. I was going to say, insert 100% emoji here. So, my, <laughs> so, our data institute has a conclusion. So, it has definitely a, a lot of value. Um, and at the same time, I mean, you've been behind the scenes of building an event like this, which there's a lot of work. There's a lot of thought put to the content. There's a lot of thought put to the experience. 
So it's impossible to have that same experience with a high frequency, but at the same time, you have to sustain that energy with you know, like a more manageable amount of events so that you can keep that energy high. Yes, 100%. Insert 100% emoji again. But uh, I mean, our, our team was in charge of putting this event together, so we know how much you know, how difficult and all the details and all the effort that went into this. But I know tomorrow we're going to wake up and we're going to be like, it was so worth it to finally come together and meet all of you in real life. And we can't wait to see all the connections that will come out of it. To finish, I have some burning questions. So I want to I wanna finish with rapid fire and really quick get some thoughts and some things. So... Should communities live in real life or virtually? In real life. <laughs> we're, we are laughing because he answered both. And we're like, you can't do that. It's not, it's against the rules. Now you know we practice. <laughs> just this one, just this one. But uh, in real life, for sure, for sure. In real life, for sure. Great. And where, let's pretend now we all said digital, virtually, okay? So, if you have a virtual community, where should it live? What's up, Discord or Slack? I don't Neither. Really yeah, I don't care. <laughs> Slack, whatever. In real life. No, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm we have a great tool. It's called Orkut. There's Orkut. A, there, there's a communities feature there you can all use. It's amazing. I'm kidding. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> It's also cheap less. No other comments. Okay, they're 100% standing behind their in real life answer. We got it. Okay, when building a community, what comes first, diversity or inclusion? Well, one leads to the other, but diversity is the outcome that we want. Um, yeah. Okay. I believe there's no diversity without inclusion. Like, th there's no impact in diversity without inclusion. So, it's impossible to choose. We could have a whole panel about this. Um, <laughs> if, if you have time, we can start. <laughs> but they come together. They're they're nicely loving together. Perfect. I agree with all of that. And to finish. Finish this sentence. Vamos. Oh. Woo. Thank you, everybody. Thank you much.